fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. One hundred two point three FM Riverside and one hundred five oh AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and of course, this is an award exchange sort of program episode. So, for you uh, softies listening, um, listen anyway, and send Dave the mail. It, that's right, Dave. I'm waiting. Uh, yeah, Dave. You know, you have to get ready for this one. Yes. You know, <laughs> I emptied out all the other emails and re- yeah. ready, ready for it to come down. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, it's a good time. It's all a good time. Anyway, uh, you know, so the power of social media. I came across this guest on social media originally, and I just love, uh, as much as I hate social media, I love it too, because I've met so many great people and had so much fun through it, and I think it's great. It's just all how you use it. So, um, And, of course, we're going to talk a little bit about the controversies and about his work, and it's fantastic. So let's welcome Ruben Kay. Thank you for being here. It is a pleasure to be here. I mean, I'm in, a, I'm in a hotel room in Montreal, so how much of a pleasure could it be? But being on the podcast with you is a pleasure. Well, I don't know. Montreal is a lot of fun. <laughs> if I could get out of this hotel to see it, but it just for laughs, all these comedians live in this hotel, all the comedians perform in the hotel, and all of the agents and writers and the networking happens in the hotel. It's a sort of... I know, it's a 14-story shark tank. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is interesting because you, you've, um, I find you very direct in your show, and sometimes it causes trouble, right? Yeah. Because that it, we're, <laughs> because we're in the times now where see, people are very, um, and we, Dave and I were talking about this earlier because it's, it's kind of a time where I think if you were doing the show in the 90s, it wouldn't be what it is now. Like it, that's not saying it right. Um, it, it, there wouldn't be so much of the fighting that's going on that we get through social media because of it. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Social media definitely opens up the debate for everyone to have an opinion, warranted or not, valid or not. Uh, and everyone is allowed to have an opinion. They're just not allowed to think that their opinion is valid or more valid than everyone else's. Um, but if I was doing what I was doing in the 90s, um, perhaps it wouldn't get as much exposure as it does now through social media. So it's a double-edged sword, really, uh, of social media giving me the exposure to give my material and, and my message and do what I do and giving me an audience. But the, the, uh, the, the backlash of that, the other result of that, is that also I get all of the hate, all of the prejudice, all of the bile as well. Do you, do you actually have a message then when you're doing a show? If someone comes to see you right now, someone yes. comes to see you, you're in Montreal now, so they come see you in Montreal, what is, what is it they should get from that show? It's an interesting thing because the show, the show spans across several different genres and bits of material. It's very filthy, it's very dirty, it's very queer, uh, but also it's quite political and at times a little sentimental and what I tend to get is queer people, trans people coming to my shows and coming up to me afterwards and saying, I felt for an hour I could be myself in a public place. I get queer pa- parents of queer children bringing their kids um, of a certain age, obviously 16 and over, 14 and over, if they think they can deal with the material, to the show as an example of a queer person living in the public eye successfully. Uh, and I sometimes even get young queer people bringing their parents to the show as an example of a queer person living their life in the public eye successfully. I think queer people are being politicised more and more and our existence is being politicised. So what I get to do, I mean, yes, there's transgression in the politics. Yes, there's transgression in the obscenity. But at the heart of it, there is a stalwart um, 
reclamation of defining my own existence as a queer person and spreading a message of sort of absurd, chaotic joy and rebellion. People have to remember that Pride started as a riot and celebration and protest in queer circles and the LGBTQIA plus community has, have always been interconnected. And that's what I'm interested in. I think there's an amazing tension in that, that it might not be present if I weren't, if I weren't to do what I do, if I were doing something else. Do you, do you ever worry about the negative response or no. the, the backlash or anything like that? If it, if it impacts the safety of others, then it's an issue. And it was in Australia um, when, uh, so I went on national TV and purely from that appearance at national TV, um, my agent suddenly had to start having meetings with state police bodies. Uh, my phone was confiscated and combed over by four separate state police bodies. Gigs were cancelled because the threats threatened not just my safety, but the safety of the audience and the safety of the businesses in the area, um, all because it was a queer person on stage not being the butt of a joke, but making the joke, not being the political football, but commenting on the game. Well, how do you deal with the criticism? Uh, can you just slough it off, or does it affect you personally? No, absolutely. I think you you would have to be um, almost superhuman to not let that amount of negative um, feedback, let's say, or hate mail, let's call it what it is, um, affect you in some way. But I have to have a steely resolve, and you have to go, no, if you're pissing the right people off, because these people are not my target audience also, right? Uh, the right. shows I'm making aren't, aren't really for them. They were never going to buy tickets to, you know, a Jewish puff singing songs <laughs> and telling jokes, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> it gives me a steely resolve. I strengthen my backbone. I square my shoulders. I set my jaw. And I know I'm on the right path because I know the audience that I'm writing for. I know the audience I'm performing for. And first and foremost, I'm performing for my community and my family who are not feeling safe. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really kind of a weird time. I, I can't tell you um, how much bad mail I get at periods. The strangest thing to me is some people seem to follow it. Um, they'll listen to the show and and send three times a week. And I'm always thinking, well, why are you listening to the show? If I mean, this is the other much? part. This is the other part. Like uh, in social media, the motto is all content is good content. So you get all these people writing hate mail on your um commenting on your posts or my posts and you get all these comments and they actually drive the algorithm and they drive it further up the algorithm because the algorithm just sees increased traffic it doesn't place a value judgment on what you're doing right, right. So in many ways it's that great liberace thing of him coming out and going, you like my rings you paid for yeah. them <laughs> <laughs> and it's true you know so that comment, that one in Australia, was that the one on the show about the um, you love Jesus and a man getting nailed? <laughs> yes. Was yes, that it the was. One? It's a joke I've been telling for over 10 years um, because I'm loath to let anything go. Uh, but I was also, I was receiving a little bit of, because I gained some popularity on TikTok and because of TikTok's universality, the ubiquitous nature of it, um, it opened me up to a huge audience of people who might not necessarily be my target audience, and these people are mainly, um, to use a politically correct term, religious whack jobs. And so I was getting some religious yeah. hate mail. Um, and you know what? Religion is fine. It's a lovely teddy bear to hold in the dark if you're not up to reading a book. Um, and I said on the show, I tend to get a lot of people in the comments saying, you have to accept Jesus' love or you will burn in hell. Which is a ridiculous comment because, and this is what I said on the project, I love Jesus. I love any man who can get nailed for three days straight and come back for more. Which, <laughs> when you break it down, is just a pun. It's just right. a, a dad joke. But my goodness me, did Christian people in Australia, or a certain subsect of Christian people, not all Christians, lost their damn minds, took to the streets, waving crosses, chanting the Lord's Prayer outside my agent's office and calling for me to be crucified, which is the dumbest thing also because it happened around April. And if they really read their scriptures or had any sense of it, they would see the irony in trying to publicly crucify a Jew that close to <laughs> Easter. Because when you think about it, isn't Easter really the only festival the Jews get to win? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Boy, I tell you, that's exciting. It makes my nipples hard. That's all I'm here to do. Now we can attach some hooks to it, and you can haul me over to you. <laughs> Oh, boy. Where, where did this start for you? And I mean this in, in a way of, uh, did you always know you were going to be doing this? This is something you were, uh, like, I was a little kid into radio. I mean, I had 50 radios at age six, and that's all I listened to was old shows and talk shows and everything. I was a freak at it at a young boy. Um, is this something you've started since you can remember performing? Oh, I think definitely, even in the womb, I was sort of doing a time step. I was raised in a very Jewish, German, Russian household in Melbourne. Uh, my family uh, came over, uh, they survived the war and came over, uh, and my mum escaped from East Berlin. She actually escaped the war, came to Australia, went back to East Berlin to build communism, and we all know how that worked out, so she escaped from East Berlin and came to Australia. Uh, and my dad was born in Paris as his family were coming through post-war Poland after spending the war building railroads for Stalin. It's a whole thing. Uh, and that's not even talking about my uncle who was a bank robber in East Berlin. And so I was <laughs> raised in this outrageous family and the TV never was never off. It always had West Side Story or a Marx Brothers film. In fact, the first film I ever saw was the Marx Brothers Night at the Opera. Uh, it had Chaplin, it had Keaton, it had Danny Kaye movies. So I was I was really sort of raised with this in my blood, and I grew up watching Jackie Mason and Joan Rivers and Judy Gold, who I ju I'm on a bill tonight with Judy Gold, who I used to watch as a kid. That's outrageous to me. So for me, I was really steeped in a a, a comedy vaudevillian musical theatre um, sensibility. And as a kid, I was a really performative kid. I used to force my parents to watch me put on shows in the living room where I would reenact the great deaths of opera, which is the campus thing anyone's ever done. I would have, like, bags of raspberry syrup um, stuffed in my clothes so that when my brother stabbed me as Carmen and I was in full drag at seven years old, I would have blood spurting out onto the floor while I lay dying. Um, <laughs> they would have to watch me. They have to watch me kind of pretend to be Ophelia and dunk my head in a bucket of water or be Tosca and throw myself off the back of the couch. It was always very camp. It was always very melodramatic. Um, so I think they looked at me and went, I don't think he's going to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so where does it come from? Where, you know, when I ask this, a lot of different artists, writers, actors, we've had everything on yeah. and I, I so where does the art come from for you where do the ideas come from oh my god the ideas come from everything my phone is a constant 63 degrees celsius i don't know what that is in fahrenheit um but i think it's adorable that you all use fahrenheit it's so universal <laughs> i i'm constantly writing things down in my phone everything everything gives me an idea from um, like, for instance, yesterday, they were doing the housekeeping in the room and I had to come in. I had to start painting my face for a gig. And I kind of was like, you can fi don't finish the room. I'll just start painting. I don't want to interrupt you. You can um, you can go off. Um, and so she said, no, I'll stay and finish. And this lovely woman just very calmly did did the housekeeping, made the bed and did all that stuff while I'm painting in drag. And she never stopped looking. Never said a word, never stopped looking. I was, like, I was so fascinated by that. Um, so that's going to be in the show. Uh, a lot of the stuff comes from my family. Uh, I've got a, a pretty incredible family story. And I think as, um, as a family that has survived the Second World War, it's part of my duty as an artist to tell that story um, in many ways to hope that uh, we don't repeat the same mistakes, which we're doing currently. Right. Um, yeah. I think there's also stories to it. The, the stories come from everywhere, and I think every artist is a thief, and the only thing you can do is try to disguise how well you steal. What's that great quote? Um, great artists oh, steal. Great, great, great artists steal. Bad artists borrow. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you, have, you have to magpie. You have to magpie everything, and I think if you only steal from one or two sources, everyone goes, oh, that's derivative, right? Or if you, but if you have thousands of influences... If you have that and you grab right. from a little something from everything, it all, um, it all um, coheres and sort of um, creates something completely unique that people can't pick. 
but it's also it should be uniquely from you because it's your taste and your taste is unique right yeah you've got to put yourself into it and and hope it comes out the right way what do you think's going on in the world then what what what's what's the issue um in your opinion like you know i i noticed a lot of complaining about um of course the uh uh, drag and trans world is getting it the worst. Um, you know, and the, the reading, you know, uh, library reading by drag queens and stuff like that. What's going on with this whole thing? Why do you think it's so? Well, I don't so think, I don't think it's top? about, I don't think it's about who's getting it, um, the worst because I think there are a lot of communities suffering right now, but we're in a moment where, um, I think we're in a moment where, Politics are very happy to play optics and play the drama of politics to avoid making policy. And that means using communities as uh, political football, using communities as wedges uh, to drive culture wars, to divide people. Uh, and I think education has a huge part to play in this. Lack of education, not investing in education, not separating church and state. Um, Allowing, uh, allowing prejudice to be seeping into the education system. Uh, I think it, it breeds, a po and, and then defunding healthcare, I think it breeds a sick population that can't critically think, and that means they're more likely to be scared, and a scared population is much easier to control and manipulate. Uh, and that means that anyone who's in a minority or a cultural minority is going to get hit hardest it's disabled people it's queer people it's um black communities it's latinx communities it's all these people who are on the lower rungs it's karate communities like dave <laughs> yeah yeah karate that's what we should be marching next uh, yeah so, uh, you know i'm i'm ready i'm ready to go outside and start yelling against these these guys doing karate. What are they thinking? <laughs> it's a yeah, I'm they're, they're coming for the kids. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They're grooming us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm too old to be groomed. <laughs> <laughs> I do it voluntarily anyway. But oh, it's just, well, who's your favorite audience? Where was your favorite place to play so far? Oh, I had Canadians. Great. Do you know what? Um, when we did the new when we got to do the show in Sydney finally after the cancellations. Um, that was a really great crowd. They'd been through a lot. You know, there were police outside. There were bag checks. There were metal detectors. Um, and that's very rare for a, a comedy audience or any theatrical audience in Australia to have that kind of um, stringent policing of it. And there was something electric in that room because we all knew we were in a, a history-making gig. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, the audiences here in Montreal have been so savvy, so quick. I've really loved them. Uh, do you know what? The best audience I think we had was in London on the night the Queen died in Soho. It was electric. And the venue said, please don't necessarily open with any um, anti-monarchy stuff. I don't know what you want to do, Ruben, but maybe just lay off it because of the sensitivity. And I got out there and I think I did 20 minutes on the monarchy and how oh my they are <laughs> and the crowd went nuts it was like bedlam it was fantastic the crowd in soho for my show the butchers back which we're bringing to edinburgh went absolutely wild uh and it was brilliant we were tearing the tearing the theater apart one time and another one i guess we went to me and my music director shannon went to a town in melbourne just outside of melbourne called dalesford Hepburn Springs, Dalesford. And it was just him, me, a piano, and a bottle of vodka at this tiny club. And the gig lasted, it was meant to last an hour. It lasted three hours. At one point, I was behind the bar serving shots while singing numbers. It was loose. It was <laughs> reckless. It was so fun. Um, and it was just to this, this country town. They didn't know what hit them. They didn't know what hit them. It felt almost sort of cinematic and apocalyptic of this tiny bar in a country town. It's like, I could be murdered at any moment. Let's keep singing. <laughs> don't try that in a small town. <laughs> I, I, I don't worry. It's fine. It's fine. My butt plug's Kevlar. No, I know. I'm protected. Yeah. <laughs>
so what do people get in the show? Like you sing, you do everything, right? So what's what's the show? Uh, it's a it's kind of a explain your show. They come in all different shapes and sizes. I have a show here at so in Montreal. We're doing my show live and intimidating, which is me and a three piece band, uh, and it's sort of a political dissection of um, hate mail and hate crimes. And this the current debate we're having it's born out of the controversy of this TV appearance. Um, but for us, the cornerstone of these shows is also always the music and how the music plays a counterpoint. There's something really sublime about having gorgeous, beautiful music, um, quite strident politics, and matching that with uh, deep obscenity. Because then the audience is continually snapped back and forth between what their expectation is and what I'm giving them. Uh, and... I think there's an element of if the politics are too much, there's always a nice song. If the songs you're not a fan of, there's always filth. And if you don't like the filth and you want something media, there's the politics, you know. Um, and, of course, I look stunning, if I do say so myself. <laughs> uh, I'm tall and statuesque. I sort of, I don't know, I look like the Babadook if he was glammed up. And then the show we're doing in... Edinburgh, the butcher's back, which we're touring around Europe and the UK for the rest of this year, is uh, an autobiographical show about my father's life uh, and coming out and parents and children and masculinity and the apocalypse, the missing link. Uh, and it's a six piece, <laughs> uh, it's a six piece band horn section. The music is outrageously good. It's incredibly dense. Um, and then we're culminating that tour. We're ending that tour in a two-hour version of the show in London uh, in the Purcell Rooms at Festival Hall on South Bank, which I can't wait for. And then we have a late-night show called The K-Hole, which, if you don't know what that is, Google it, but don't press image search, uh, is a late-night sort of post-punk <laughs> queer protest party where me and a rock band take my favorite acts from around the world or whatever fringe festival I'm playing in. And I tell the acts, get angry, get drunk, get naked, get on stage. And it's full nudity. It's loose. It's hot. It's steamy. It's queer. It's messy. It's fucking hilarious. I don't know. It's sort of, it sounds like Dave's show, right? Yeah, I'm just waiting for that. <laughs> it harks back to, um, I think the birth of Cabaret and what I think Cabaret truly is, which is the original punk before electric music came in, um, it's immediate to the time. And it also has the vibe of a, I don't know, a, a secret gig, a rock concert, a speakeasy. No, sweaty, Ooh. dirty, secret. It's the best. Yeah. I really do get yeah. to play with this whole gamut of being in uh, – highfalutin arts festivals playing in state theatres and then playing in garages and bunkers and sweaty 20-seater venues, you know. It's a really lovely um, and exciting existence uh, to make work and a great environment to make work in. Wow, yeah, that does sound like a Dave show. Um, <laughs> I can't wait. I want to see a Dave I'm, show now. I'm naked I... right <laughs> now. Yes. Oh, right now, this is the show? He's, get he's already naked. He's, I'm yeah, already he's... naked. I'm... I'm doing video right now for OnlyFans while we're talking. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll subscribe. I'll subscribe. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he's got to make a living somewhere. Yeah, yeah, right? You do what you have to. Okay. Do you write your own music then, too? For the, we for are the, writing the originals as well. We do covers and originals. We think it's very, I and, think it's very interesting to give the audience, when the content is so dense, to be able to then give them one or two covers that they know so that there's a landing point a little bit of a respite for them. So, for instance, in this show, Live and Intimidating, we have a, uh, a gorgeous cover of Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow, uh, the Carol King classic, um, as this sort of standalone moment in the show where everything stops uh, and we think about the nature of living in a public life, being queer in a public life, um, hate mail, what an audience's response to an artist is. And then the, the delivery of that song is um, sort of a, a slightly mournful um and provocative counterpoint or questions the audience. Yeah, you're looking at me now, you're laughing along, but is one of you going to send me a death threat later? Is one of you going to pull out a gun? I don't know. Are you going to love me tomorrow as much as you love me tonight? Maybe someone will throw their mo dead mother's ashes at you. Oh, the dream. <laughs> I'm running out of setting powder as it is. <laughs>
<laughs> I couldn't. That's what someone did to Pink. Hey, you see that? Oh, my oh did God. they? Yeah, they, they, they. She's singing, and they had the their dead mother's ashes, and they threw it up at her on stage. And she stopped the show, and then she found out what it was. It was just, it was a shock. It was just everyone didn't know what to say. Well, you like, don't know what, what it is. Someone's throwing powder on you. It could be cocaine. It could be anthrax. It could be anything. A dead, your dead mum's ashes. What a wish. My mum wants her ashes yeah. funneled into the salt and pepper shakers at her favourite restaurant. And the problem is, McDonald's only does sachets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, you know, I'm, yeah, yeah. What's it, when, when you're talking about your father in that one show, so, and, and how is that for you and your family and stuff? How, how, do, how do you decide what you're going to talk about? I decide what I'm going to talk about, um, I decide what I'm going to talk about based on what the show needs and what is true and what I'm making. Um, and then my family has to, I think, understand that, um, I mean, I'm not making things up. I'm not right. making things up and I don't think any family relationship is perfect. But my family has to know that I love my dad. I loved my dad. My dad loved me. We were very proud of each other and supportive. Um, and the show uh, says that and states that, but it also doesn't shy away from the complicated nature of children and parents, fathers and sons, and parents of queer children in the early 2000s when there wasn't the representation, there wasn't the understanding, there wasn't the education. Right, right. And I think there's a moment where I don't think I treat him unfairly. I think I, I explain to the audience exactly what a wonderful human being he was. It's actually not about passing judgment on someone. Um, this is about explaining a situation and hoping that future parents watching or children watching can take a little something away from it as either a cautionary tale or a lesson learned, and I hope that it brings families closer together. Well, and that's important, you know. I, I you know, I grew up, um, of course, Dave and I, I grew up much, uh, we're a little bit older than you, of course, so yeah. um, for me, coming out in the 80s and stuff like that, it was a totally different scenario. Mm. Um, and uh, so, I mean, yeah, I understand. Like, my dad, too, had a, a you know, he was quite the character, um, but uh, it, people, a lot of times when they hear some of the stories, they think, oh, what an awful man. And it's like, well, no, it's not that I'm saying that. It's just he was, he is a product of what he grew up with, with his parents. That's exactly, you know? we can only express ourselves in the vocabulary we've been given, you know, to a certain extent. And I don't think a lot of people, I don't think a lot of men are given in society the vocabulary that they really need or deserve, quite frankly. Uh, and I'm not saying that uh, they have no agency in this. We all have agency to work on ourselves and do that. But, you know, that journey uh, looks different for everyone, you know, and some people are, are, are going, are taking that first step from halfway through and some are doing it from, you know, day dot. So you're going to go see Barbie? I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Barbenheimer fan through and through. I'm seeing Oppenheimer at the IMAX. I'm going to get very high and I'm going to watch Oppenheimer at the IMAX, uh, and then I'm going to hope that that giggle high continues, and I'm going straight into Barbie. I want Margot Robbie. I want Ryan Gosling. I want the full fantasy. I want Greta Gerwig. I want pointed toes. <laughs> well, there you go. Dave, Dave just saw the uh, Oppenheimer. So That's 70 millimeter IMAX. Oh, the dream. Yeah. The dream you speak in my language. Yes. <laughs> you, can't, you can't see it or hear it now, listeners, but I am so erect at hearing that. <laughs> there you go. It's like Dave every day. Yeah. <laughs> they had to stop the, show, the filming. It was terrible. Oh, was my God. Like the human the, Cialis. Yeah. The, the IMAX <laughs> broke down. Yeah. It was me. Yeah. Oh. In the middle of Dave's. Yeah. He's re yeah. there to do the review, and, and it broke down. And Yeah. It was only because he was in his karate outfit and yeah. erect and all erect. And well. It's like everybody ran. Look, at least that karate oh. outfit is absorbent and white. No one will know what the hell <laughs> exactly. is going on. Right. <laughs> well, See? there are no lamps in there to knock over, so, you know. <laughs> Projectors. That's all I could do. There's just a very oh, suspicious sorry. shadow going up against the screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's awful, you know. <laughs> I'll tell you. So, uh, well, you know, you're fantastic. I just want you to know. I, it, it's more, it, you know, we really want to put you on the show, talk to you a little bit, and show you some support and tell you how much i think it's important doing what you do and i think that um it means a lot to people um and you probably don't always know that but 
hopefully you do. And and I think, you know, anything you need, just keep on going. We're really in support of you, you know. Thank you so much. We're out there. It's so lovely to see uh, the response that this has sort of gotten globally has really been, sure, it's a mixed bag and there are haters and there are, you know, certain, uh, let's say, undesirables. Um, But so much love, so much support has come through this. And the one thing I think of is because that support is so visible, it really makes a difference to the people who are watching all of this unfold who might think, oh, I don't have the courage to face something like that. I don't have the courage to come out. I don't have the courage to live myself, live my life authentically. And if they see moments like this where someone is in the spotlight or the bullseye and they see the rest of the world rallying around them, it really sends a fantastic message. Yeah, and because it, it, I'm sort of taken back in a sense of some of the response you got on some of the things you've done, and see, and I see some of the news uh, clips, and some of them are so negative, and I'm just thinking it just seemed like it was the '90s, like for me, and and I used to do makeup for a lot of the drag queens that were performing that came to Seattle. Um, back in my old college days, because I used to work at the makeup counter. <laughs> oh, amazing. For Estee Lauder. Yeah. Oh, gr- that, is so, so so, camp. that is bright. But I thought, you know, for I don't know why, I thought the fight had been won, you know, Madonna. <laughs> and I really thought this was it. You know what? Um, we're, we're, we're making it. And it's and it's all we can leave all that bad stuff behind, and we're going forward, and things were great, are going to be great. It's it's and, so interesting. Um, better for the next the generation. Thing. I used to think the same yeah. thing when I first started this um, iteration of my career. With this, the, I made the decision to I'm going to be in drag, and I'm going to be doing queer this thing. Um, I kind of thought, oh well, this will be irrelevant in five years. Look at how fast progress is happening. Marriage is being same-sex marriage is being legalised, etc., etc. Et and then, as the years have gone, I've gone, no, this is more relevant now than ever. What I'm doing is more relevant to the world and me than ever. I'm I'm hoping that it's a cycle that'll pass and we'll get through it. You know, I I, I did a book back for the 1920s of a uh, Leopold and Loeb. And, yeah. and talking about um, in Germany about how big the cabarets were, like you said, mentioned, about how the gay cabarets and everything, it was so big before the Nazi regime came mm. in. And it's it just such a change uh, of what's, what happened. But I'm just hoping that we don't have to go through that again. You know, I don't I don't have an answer for that because I yeah. used to think, oh, we couldn't possibly. But every day it, it, there are new monstrosities. I mean, the USA uh, is at last count. I think it's step seven of the 10 steps to genocide that are recognized by um, the human rights associations, the International Human Rights Association. So I don't have an answer for that. I just know that we have to keep keep fighting. And keep yeah. living our lives. Oh, for sure. For sure. So now, when are you going to write a book? Well, <laughs> there might be something in the pipeline. First, I'm going to have to learn how to read. No. <laughs> but there could be something in the p- pipeline at the moment. And I'd, I'm doing a short list of titles at the moment as well. Yeah, I could imagine. <laughs> I was thinking I know, I know. was thinking about doing sort of my life as a musical, but set in uh, a late night kebab shop. And I could call it Halal Dolly. <laughs> I thought it could be, be kind oh. of. Kind of nice as, I don't know, Miss Pelvic Flawless, 1984. That'll be quite nice. Uh, yeah. but at the moment, um, I'm, I'm writing something called Journey to the Center of Attention. And I think that's a real nice, that clinches a, at the moment for me. But if anyone out there has a good idea for a title, shoot me a message. <laughs> well, it, now, so speaking of shooting on you, no, actually. <laughs> what a segue. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was going to say that actually, um, so how do people get a hold of you? Do you do social media yourself? Are you around on social media like TikTok? I, and I am indeed. I am, I am so accessible, it's actually possibly dangerous for my mental health. You can find me on Instagram at Ruben K. You can find me on TikTok at Ruben K. You can find me on Facebook as Ruben K. It's, it's pretty, pretty much open, open slather across all forms of social media. I'm on threads, even though I hate it. I'm on Twitter, but that's mostly for the porn. Yeah. I'm around. <laughs> yeah. I got a website, rubenk.com. Keep it simple. And I, I can't wait. This is my first time in North America, and I'm just having the best time out here. I want to explore the rest of 
um, I want to come down to America and explore the rest of this amazing continent. Yeah, it's, it's pretty. It's, there's, there's a lot of great places to see and a lot of great people to do. I was know. actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm bringing I'm bringing suitcases of lube. I was actually meant to come to I was meant to come to Seattle uh, in twenty in the Christmas of nineteen ninety no of um, two thousand and nineteen. I was meant to come oh. for Christmas to do. Do you know Kitten and Lou in Seattle? I don't, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Kitten yeah. and Lou. Um, they have a Christmas pageant, a queer Christmas pageant for the month of sort of November December for Christmas yeah. and I was meant to be a guest on it and two days before I um, was meant to fly I went in for a, a little sinus operation and the breathing tube sliced into my larynx and I stopped speaking oh. for three oh. months um, so I had to cancel last minute my appearance and I was devastated it, it was going to be my North American debut my United States debut and I was so excited and I had to cancel it so you know I owe you one is what I'm saying. Yeah. Emerald City. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. it's, it's a pleasure talking to you. We're going to have your stuff all over the place, too. We'll have it up so people can find you with one click when they go to our website. And, uh, you know, it'll be thrilled. I mean, they'll be excited. It'll make your nipples hard, please. Are they, <laughs> can they get any harder? Cut glass. That's me. I'm basically a jewel. <laughs> I'm, I'm a jewel anyway. I think of myself as a diamond. I love to be polished. And I'm best sat atop the fingers of the wealthy. Yeah, story of my life, but they don't <laughs> care anymore now that I'm 60. It doesn't, you know, it just, I'm old now. So There's a market. You're a daddy now. You're a daddy. You've got to find That's what yourself. I'm told. Yeah, that's what I'm told. I've got to get out there that, you know, daddies are in. I keep getting told that, but maybe, maybe <laughs> I'll get out there and find out, you know. Maybe. Dave takes all the, you know, attention. You know, yeah. You know. And then it's no, it and wearing a dress and all that Yeah. Stuff. You know, everybody looks at him. They don't care about me. <laughs> it's nice of him to help this old man out, is what they say. Stuff like that. Oh, that's lovely. So halfway between, halfway between a, a colleague and a carer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He pushes me around in the wheelchair and yeah, yeah. helps. <laughs> well, Ruben, this is fantastic. I know you're a busy guy and got lots to do. So anyway, we we appreciate being here. And again, our guest, Ruben K. Thank you. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This is the introduction of something with media. I'll be back.